what to do about the global container shortage. I'm joined by Rob Hanfield. He is Bank of America Professor of Supply Chain Management with the Supply Chain Resource Cooperative in the Poole College of Management at North Carolina State University. Hello, Rob. Uh, hi, Robert. Pleasure to be here with you today. And thank you for being with me. So uh, describe the current state of affairs as you see it with regard to ocean container availability globally. Well, what, is, what has happened is, um, you know, since, since uh, Western countries, uh, especially the United States, uh, buy so much from China, uh, all of the traffic uh, of containers has been going from China to the United States. And those containers ultimately, you know, are uh, then put on a truck and they're trucked all over the country to different locations across the U.S. Most of the shipments from China end up at, at LAX and then they're transported. Well, what do people do with the containers when they are done with them? Answer, they probably put them behind the factory and let them sit there. Uh, there really isn't a good mechanism for getting them back uh, to the port and back to their origin. Normally, what also happens is containers, um, you know, go back and forth. But the volume of traffic that's going from the United States to China in terms of exports is very low relative to the amount coming from China to the U.S. Mm -hmm. So as a result of that, uh, no one wants to ship, pay to ship empty containers back from the U.S. to China. And China is facing a massive shortage of containers right now. And that's causing uh, real snarls in the uh, global logistics and, and, and supply chain. Were we seeing this state of affairs before the pandemic or is it caused by the pandemic? Well, it's always sort of been a problem. And um, for some reason, it's, it's really been exacerbated by the pandemic. And uh, I think par partially, you know, we've seen more uh, sourcing to China and low cost countries in the past few years. Um, there's also been, uh, you know, uh, an increase. More and more people are buying stuff from China, uh, especially through sources like Amazon and others. So, so people have been buying more stuff in general and uh, it's been coming over by container. And so you, you see people complaining, for instance, of shortages of bicycles. You know, everyone started riding bikes during the pandemic. Yeah. Shortages of, of Peloton machines. Um, so so uh, I even you know, bought a guitar for my son and uh, they told me it's on back order six months. So wow. you know, it's, it's crazy that everything seems to be uh, short right now. And it was exacerbated by the uh, Suez Canal crisis as well. When that was blocked, uh, I think there were more than 200 ships uh, that were waiting to get through. So that those delays have been exacerbated mm -hmm. by those kinds of issues as well. So we're talking about a shortage, not just of the metal boxes, the containers themselves, but of the product that goes in them. The products themselves are, are short in, in certain ways as well, right? That's absolutely right. And, and mm -hmm. you know, people don't think of supply chains as, uh, you know, stages of different things. And, and this has um, problems in ways that you wouldn't even think about. For instance, when you think about the vaccine, um, the biggest shortages for the vaccine is not the manufacturing capacity. It's the components. One of those components, for instance, is filters. Well, what are filters produced from? They're produced from these substrates. So chances are the substrates are traveling over uh, from China to Europe in a container ship. So, mm -hmm. so it, it's, it's causing these, these shortages in areas that you wouldn't normally think are, are uh, exposed to shortages. So if it's the product as well as the container, I guess the answer to this problem is not just build more containers, correct? I mean, we could. We could manufacture more steel containers, could we not? We, we could do that. Um, I know one of the things that we're seeing uh, is, is some of the um, container ship companies and logistics companies are coming together and saying, look, we've got to address this problem. We've got to find a way to, uh, you know, pull all this, uh, pull these containers together and, and uh, you know, get them back to China where they need to be to, to get these shipments out. What's happening in China is literally there are, there are, uh, there's cargo waiting to be loaded onto ships, uh, but they can't, it can't be loaded. You know, you can't, if there's no containers, you can't put the product, just throw it onto a ship. It has to go in a container, mm -hmm. which allows it to be stacked in an efficient way. 
What role has the arrival of these mega ships for the last few years played in the container availability or lack of container avail uh, availability situation? Well, that's that's sort of a, been, been a pet peeve of mine, actually. Uh, you know, the ships have been getting larger and larger, and uh, they've also been getting slower and slower. Um, you know, you, you're hearing what you, you talk about these slow schemers, and they, these large ships may go to multiple ports. So what this has resulted in is the lead times of getting uh, stuff shipped uh, across the ocean and container ship has gone up. Mm -hmm. And it's now it could be, you know, four to six weeks. Uh, now, if, if you're if you're slow shipping your container overseas, well, think about it. That's like working capital that's sitting mm -hmm. there. It's not earning you money by sitting on a ship. And when it does get held up like it did in the Suez Canal, you can't just send a helicopter over to pick it up because it's probably under a bunch of other containers on it. So there's there's some real problems with that industry. And. Uh, in my opinion, they've been going the wrong way. And I think the, the lack of containers is part of a bigger problem with that whole industry that they need to be speeding up the shipments, not slowing them down. They got a little carried away with the so-called unit economies of the mega ships. I mean, that was one calculation that they were making, but it didn't extend to the uh, law of unintended consequences elsewhere through the supply chain, did it? It, it certainly didn't. And, and this yeah. is something that you know Tom Linton and I write about in our forthcoming book, called flow. And we believe that, you know, we need to be thinking more about uh, quick flows of materials and how do we accelerate the flows of materials in global supply chains mm -hmm. to make them move more quickly. And I think working capital will become the next uh, really important metric to, to gauge the efficiency of supply chains. Working capital for what purpose though? What would you, do you, what would you use it for in order to increase the flow of supply chains? Well, by, by working capital, I mean inventory is really working capital. I see. Mm -hmm. So if, it's, if, if you have 50 days of inventory versus 30 days of inventory, you have more working capital on your books. I understand. And your balance sheet is greater. But, but again, you're, there's a cost of capital. There's a cost of having that working capital sitting on a container ship for six weeks. Yeah. Well, I mean, companies are starting to realize that the just-in-time strategy in its purest form is not necessarily a good idea in a moment of disruption like we're facing now, but maybe this is the other extreme. You need more inventory as buffer stock, but you don't need that much, right? Well, and I, I think that's also a misnomer, uh, Robert, because you know people think of just-in-time as not keeping any inventory. Mm -hmm. But what they don't uh, add to that is it, it has also to do with co-location. I mean, if you think of companies like Honda and Toyota, all of their suppliers are nearby. Very often they're within right. five miles of that factory. So if you have just enough inventory, that's fine. But if you're buying it from overseas in a factory in China that you don't know where they're, it's coming from, well, that's not really just in time, is it? That's just in case, and you're keeping a lot of inventory on hand. Mm -hmm. So what are some solutions we can explore? I mean, it seems to me that as the economy recovers, the situation will only get worse because consumer demand will get even higher. So what are you proposing as some possible avenues of solution to this, to this problem? Well, I think you know, what's happened in China is the, the uh, labor costs have actually gone up. So China is, yeah. is no longer a developing economy. It's, it's really a very developed economy. Um, and so we've started to see some of the low cost sourcing go to places like Bangladesh and Vietnam and Cambodia. Uh, but I think uh, for organizations in the US, in the West, I think uh, more organizations are gonna start looking at Mexico as a destination. You know, Mexico is low cost labor. They speak Spanish, a lot of them speak English. It's within a day uh, drive or flight. And, um, it, and when you start looking at all of the costs, I think uh, Mexico is, is really a great option. And when you combine the low cost labor in Mexico with the low cost natural resources in Canada and the low cost of capital in the US, that could become a very powerful trading block mm -hmm. if those three countries come together and, and really act together in a, in a collaborative fashion. Well, theoretically, it's supposed to be already with NAFTA first followed by the US-Mexico-Canada agreement. That was the whole purpose of the agreement. And yet I guess you're saying that that, uh, that, that goal has not been fully realized. I, I don't think so. I don't think they're fully exploiting all the benefits that, that potentially mm -hmm. could be derived from that arrangement. 
but certainly you would eliminate the stage of the slow container ship if a lot of your production was in Mexico. You wouldn't need ships at all for a lot of that stuff. You just bring it on over the roads and rail. Well, that's exactly right. And and you know, I work with with a large industrial manufacturer, and they did just that. They relocated their suppliers from China and India over to Mexico, and they have they have tr uh, tractor trailers that come directly from Juarez and they arrive twice a day and, and uh, you know, they're, they're on a rotating basis and, and, and it's very efficient mm -hmm. and they have very low inventory and, and uh, excellent quality and uh, great uh, supplier relationships with those, with, with those Mexican suppliers. But when it comes to exports, especially agricultural exports, we can't tell farmers, don't worry about overseas, just sell all your stuff to Canada and Mexico. They need those containers to ship their product overseas. They're not getting them right now because the carriers are turning containers around at the port in order to rush them back to China and fill them with import cargo. So what do you say to a U.S. exporter right now as to how it might cope with this situation going forward? Well, I, I think, you know, we've seen the demand for those uh, farm goods you know, go down a lot uh, because of, of tariffs. Um, you know, when, when the Trump administration exerted tariffs, China exerted their own tariffs on a lot of farmers, especially in, you know, soybeans and, and hogs and a number of other areas. Uh, this has really hurt farmers. Um, the Biden administration has indicated that, uh, you know, they want to maintain the tariffs as negotiating leverage, but hopefully we'll see some of those come down because, as you say, those are really important markets. Uh, China is, is one of the most important markets for American farmers, especially in areas like soybean. So, uh, so hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll see those free up and we'll see more ships going to China with, with American produce in it. Well, it doesn't sound like a problem that's going to be solved overnight, but Rob Hanfield of North Carolina State University, you've helped us understand what some of the solutions might be and what some of the causes to this particular moment of unavailability of both container and product might be. Thank you very much for taking the time with me. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Glad to do it.